we have heard a couple of great talks, both today and yesterday and the day before yesterday, and I could not help to, to compare the research I am doing and that you will be hearing about uh, to, to that talk that blew me away on Monday, uh, given by Jean-Pierre uh, Biering on the, on the um, Rosetta mission. And <clears throat> so we heard uh, about his project that took at least 10 years, and um, he, plays, he managed to place an object uh, 551 million kilometers away within a 100 meter radius, and <clears throat> then touching rocks that were, or let's say material, four and a half billion years old, telling you about the origin and the composition of the solar system. And <clears throat> the research I am doing, I could take you today, now, if you just took your passport and a little piece of plastic, and we bought the, the, uh, the cab, we would go to the airport, I could take you within less than 24 hours to rocks that are 3.22 billion years old. They are about 8,000 kilometers away, and I could place you there with accuracy and precision and repeatability within about a meter. That is, we would find the very same outcrop the next year again, yeah? and we would be more precise again and again. And of course, I should go back here. What, what Jean-Pierre did not tell you here is what, what his research cost. And, and if I, I, I looked up what my research would cost if I took you there to, to Barberton now, uh, starting today, and in this, in this price, actually, the cab to the airport already is included. So uh, you could, what's the difference between his price and my, his research, my, my research? You can do 10 to the 6 projects, a million projects of my type for the one project that Jean-Pierre communicated to us. We still have to do both. Right? There's, there's no way around it. So, um, here, this is what you get. Yeah, I'll place you on a rock, and <clears throat> so not just a leg of, a, of an instrument uh, touching something and you get a picture of it. No, but you have an, a 3.2 times 10 to the 1 uh, grad student who is actually sitting here in the third row looking at a rock. You know, this is a Homo sapiens sapiens. No, this is the Homo sapiens. You see, this is the, the double twice as old uh, professor, he's a sapiens sapiens, <laughs> and you look at rocks, okay, and you have lots of them, and you, you put your brain within decimeters or centimeters of it, right, recognizing things. So why is this important? Um, the, we want to answer four questions, right? And first, how to build a continent, because by now we believe to know that we need continents in order to sustain life, uh, of course, we want to know how and where life originated, and we heard a great talk yesterday by Laurie Barge on the hydrothermal vents and so on, and I'll bring you close a different environment. We want to learn about meteorite impacts uh, that were certainly a factor in early Earth, and of course, the greatest question, so question of all, is life easy and should therefore be ubiquitous, or is it difficult and may therefore be unique on Earth? Are we alone? Right? And all these are questions that can be addressed through the research many of us are doing. So, where do we go? I'll take you on that trip. If you're interested in, in early life, you only have these, rock, these red areas here to choose from, and many of them have been really cooked to hell and are highly metamorphosed. You, there are only actually two places in Earth that you can look at well-preserved, really old rocks. That well-preserved means within their geological context. One of them is the Kapwal Craton here, number 12, in South, South Africa, in Swaziland, and the other one is number 8 here, West Australia, the Pilbara region. So we'll go to, to the Kapwal region, and we look at a greenstone belt that is a, a sequence of sedimentary and volcanic rocks. Sure, they have been metamorphosed, but they are in, contact, in, in context. And this forms a hilly or mountain range about 130 kilometers long and about 40 kilometers wide, straddling the South African Swazi border. The black dot here is just for that smudge, is not a smudge. It is, you recognize its shape, the shape, that's the four by two kilometer size comet, um, just for size comparison, right, in terms of what kind of material we have. And you can walk all over this mountain range. It gives you a real picture of, yeah, of the surface conditions of early Earth. This is what it looks like. The relief is much better than in Australia, 1,200 meters. There are places you can fall down from and you will not survive it. 
And <coughs> so it's a place that is very famous. All the geologists go there all the time. And we've been put up a number of monuments and <coughs> panels and uh, viewing panels. So this is, it's gaining in popularity. And I would invite all of you just to, to join me uh, one of these days and uh, for a field trip there. So the stratigraphy, what's actually preserved there, the time recorder, is about 16 kilometers thick in stratigraphic thickness. Many of the rocks stand on end, so you walk across it like an ant over across a book. Down here you have the Onferwacht group, which is probably an oceanic plateau or a hotspot. 10,000 meters of, of basalts and comatiites. This is where we should find the vents that, um, that we uh, heard about yesterday, but Unfortunately, we don't for some reason. Um, then comes the fig tree group, which is probably a volcanic arc. And then the Moody's group, which are mostly continental shallow water sandstones and conglomerates and so on. And these <coughs> 16,000 meters of strata record about 350 million years of, of time. So that's a significant piece of a chunk of time in Earth history. And as you see in map view, these rocks are not flat lying. They have been very tightly deformed and metamorphosed and form these elongate uh, structures we call synclines and anticlines. However, the exposures are great and you just, you can walk through there and without any problems and, and have very significant recordings. Some of the rock types are these famous black churts. Yeah, they are black churts or chemical sediments made of silica and they are black because they contain some organic material. And from those rocks that are about 3,450 million years old, some of the oldest, let's say some of the earliest life has been described, right? And these are putative body fossils and I will skip the discussion on credibility. Yeah? And you, but you see that these are uh, carogenous structures that are famously spindle shaped. Some people always find spindles and others are cocoidal, and some are filamentous. And uh, these, are, um, these are structures that most reasonable scientists would tend to believe that they actually represented fossils, right? There's no proof in sciences, you know that, that's only in math, um, but, but this is something people would typically believe in. 3,450, some of them form these laminations and clusters and, and clumps, and they even have been <laughs> interpreted to represent photosynthetic microbial mats 3,400 million years old. So therefore, of course, it's of great interest to record and to, uh, to document their degree of preservation and to figure out whether any biochemical information may be preserved. So because that mountain range is so deformed, this here is a cross section, it would make sense to take the the examples from the uppermost group where you would, the Moody's strata, where you would expect the deformation to be least, okay? And therefore, we, Moody's group is, is, let me go back quickly. Moody's group is very well exposed. You can walk over hundreds and hundreds of meters of continuous sections. It's a shallow water sequence. There are lots of sedimentary structures that are, uh, uh, very shallow water uh, document structures. There are lots of mud cracks here, for example, uh, documenting uh, intermittent exposure. And we, by now we think we understand the Moody's group fairly well to be something like a, a, a braided river conglomeratic delta that was subjected to rather high tidal ranges. And within the Moody's group, we have these, these microbial mats. They, are, they occur here as, as, as greenish, crinkly laminations. Uh, you have seen this is a picture of our traveling slab at, at this conference. We didn't bring it with us. Typically, we take it along with us to all the other conferences. And you see what they look like. This is, this is carogenous matter, carogen. Um, they form a micro relief because we know that because up here you have ripples. Um, so they are of, of the same magnitude. Um, they've formed, uh, they formed little channels that then were for, filled with uh, with coarser sand, so this, the micro-relief existed already at the surface and is not just a late diagenetic deformation feature in the subsurface. And uh, these, these microbial mats are pliable and were deformed by fluid escape processes because we see how they occasionally ruptured and fluid and gases escaped upward. Some of these biomats overgrow even cobbles 
and, and gravel. So they lived in a very high energy environment and occasionally they became <coughs> hardened, probably dried out, and were then ripped up in elongate playing card sized chips and fragments that were transported along and filled shallow and wide tidal channels. So nothing of that is, is unusual. It just shows you that we have an excellent geological context, which is what Barberton is all about. Yeah, in any older rocks on Earth, you only have metamorphosed fragments and they are covered or uh, it's not much to look at. Some of them have, uh, you've seen that, these bubbles in them, and others have these elongate chert uh, bands, which by now we think are actually caves or cavities, very shallow um, lift-off structures. And these chert bands here are, can reach sometimes rather high thicknesses, and in thin sections, you see that grains float in them, and the rest is made of chert with, with uh, kerogen. And when you break this open carefully and put it under the SEM, you actually do see filamental structures. And uh, this is all Martin's work, and who, who, who then des described in particular the tufts. Martin has a whole classification on this. So these are the oldest tufted microbial mats. And I would like to emphasize the word tuft, right? These are not stromatolites. These, uh, these filaments held themselves up by their own strength, not by, uh, not by mineralization. They occur only in the photic zone. They are adaptable, they are widespread, and they are resistive, they are highly productive. They overgrow virtually everything, including all kinds of short-term geological structures. So all these are properties that are known in their combination actually only from cyanobacteria, right? So by now we think that these are probably comparable and resemble these structures that we know from Tunisia, as well as from many other places where they have been well investigated and the communities of cyanobacterial mats, they are well characterized. So the question here in my talk actually is, then do these microbial mats still contain any biomarker information? Can we figure out whether they actually were tired, you know, where you had photosynthetic uh, uh, organisms on the top and then some sulfur uh, oxidizing and then uh, some sulfate reducers? So we, are, we took from the Moody's group the very, very best samples we could find um, in uh, deep within the belt, away from any strain, uh, very strongly silicified, very well preserved. And it took us a couple of years to find these places that would be the section up here. And then we took the instruments to it, Raman spectroscopy, vitreolite reflectance, and rock evalpyrolysis. And Inga Köhler, my postdoc here, went to work. So we are looking at one of these thin sections here, 20 millimeters thick, and <clears throat> four millimeters now in the enlarged section. We'll take another look at this one here. And this is just beautiful kerogen that has been not compacted at all. Um, and it gives beautiful Raman spectra with D and G bands, the disordered carbon, the graphite carbon that you heard about from Mark. And we then did, of course, uh, maps across it, sections, I think these are 50 data points, trying to figure out whether we saw any differences in the thermal overprint. However, as you see from the map here, base of the biomat, top of the biomat, 50 data points across it, you see get the D bands and the G bands, and it all looks pretty much the same. When you do a thermal analysis, trying to figure out how much temperature these biomats have experienced, we have here eight samples anywhere between 320, maybe 330 degrees to 450, right? The error of uncertainty in Raman is plus minus 50 degrees or so. We also did vitreonite reflectance, which gave us the similar results here. You see an RM value of between two and 5% from 12 values. Here are three other samples of which we did two measurements each. They all gave values around two to three. And if you order that reflectivity <coughs> values, these, these numbers yeah, between two and four into, into the maturation spectrum that you typically do with vitreonite reflectance, you get temperatures that are actually beyond the, the, useful, the useful limitations of that technique, way more than 300 degrees Celsius. And lastly, we did a bit of rock eval pyrolysis on six samples. And if you include, if you exclude a, a low, a layer and a high layer, all the other four samples plot very tightly between around 330 to 340 degrees Celsius. 
Okay? So all our three thermal techniques gave us the same answers, essentially, that these Moody's biomats have been cooked uh, significantly, even though they are very well preserved. And therefore, when looking at a cross-section through that belt and looking at that the samples up here already have experienced these high temperatures, you would not expect to have any other better values or lower temperatures from the older and lower lying strata in the Barberton Greenstone belt either. So, in conclusion, I'd say we're making progress, right? We can say that there won't be any biomarkers and the, that direction we sh probably should not follow very much longer. By now, we think we do understand the composition and the tired or possibly tired architecture of these, of these biomats and one can do more work here. Of course, we're getting into the phases, setting environment, more work to be done. Morphology, we still don't quite understand, right? Metabolism and redox, we don't know what they, how they lived. They look like cyanos, but we cannot confirm that they actually produced oxygen. They probably would give us some information about the range and frequency of tides, and of course, we might be able to get some information on surface radiation out of it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>